Hi everyone, Dr. Susan Brown, Director of the Center for Better Bones. I'm really pleased to be with you today. And today we're going to take a few moments for me to answer your questions about vitamin K. As many of you know, vitamin K is a key nutrient in the Better Bones program. And so we get lots of questions about this particular nutrient. Let's look at your questions and see how many of them we can answer. The first question is, what is the difference between vitamin K, vitamin K2, MK7 and MK4? Well, as it turns out, there's actually many different types of vitamin K. It's a family of nutrients that can be classified for our purposes into K1, which is phenylcholine, which is produced by plants. So when you eat the green leafy vegetables, the kale, the collards, the bok choy, you're getting K1 from the green leafy plants, and that's extremely important. It's a short-lived vitamin K, it's not really high dose in plants, but it is very important to help the body do many things. And we're gonna talk about that in a second. And then, so this is K1, and then there's K2. And K2 is another family of vitamin K, of vitamin Ks. And you commonly hear MK4 and MK7. These are types of K2. The K2 is produced by bacteria. And actually, the bacteria, when we ferment certain foods, produces K2. And that's why you're gonna see most good sources of K2 are fermented foods, where the good sources of K1 are plant sources. So, there are types of vitamin K because there's a basic structure, this is K1, and then they, it's com it is combined with these isoprenoid side chains. If you have a lot of side chains, or a number of side chains, or four of them, it's called MK4. If you have seven side chains, it's called MK7. These are all forms of vitamin K. These are K2, this is K1. These are the ones we're most concerned about for bone health. Vitamin K2 has a special value for bone health. Vitamin K1 also has important values. It helps to do some of the same things vitamin K2 does, but it's not nearly as potent or long-lasting. The types of K2, talk about bone health, we're thinking mainly K2. MK4, MK7. I hope that's straight. Very similar, but significantly different in their actions. Vitamin K2, whether MK7 or K4, is essential for bone health, one of the things that vitamin K2 does is that it activates the key bone protein called osteocalcin. And this is a protein that helps calcium attach to the bone. So you need vitamin K and vitamin K2 in particular to activate osteocalcin, which allows calcium to stay on the bone. Another interesting thing that vitamin K2 does is it also activates a protein that keeps calcium out of the arteries. You might wonder, how does the body know to make bone hard tissue but not to make the arteries hard tissue? And that's because there's certain turnoff proteins that tell the body don't calcify the arteries. Vitamin K2, and particularly in the form of MK7, is now very well documented to be a major factor to prevent arterial calcification. And we're gonna talk just about a few of those studies. So the benefit for bone is that it keeps calcium in the bone and actually it also keeps calcium out of the arteries, which is extremely important. Both MK7 and MK4 have been found to stimulate bone formation and reduce bone loss. And there's many studies showing that if you give these nutrients, it'll really dramatically halt the rate of bone loss, say amongst postmenopausal women. And now they even see have shown that in children, it's very important to have adequate <coughs> K2, that it actually helps in children also to protect the heart and to build bone. <coughs> the, the nutrient we often use is MK7. This is vitamin K2 as MK7, and it's known as menaquinone 7. You might recognize this lovely picture. This is a fermented soy from Japan. It's called natto. It is like um, the Limburger cheese of Japan. It's got a very strong smell. If you can eat it, I congratulate you. It was recently studied that the Japanese people who eat this regularly, they discovered that they have much better bone health and much better heart health, so they started researching what's in this 
rather goopy, fermented soy. And what was in it was vitamin K2 is MK7. And now much research is done on MK7 from natto to show the benefits for both the heart and the bone. MK7, high in the Japanese diet, provides a high level of vitamin K as MK7 in the Japanese diet. The therapeutic dose is anywhere from 45 to 360 micrograms, a tiny amount, micrograms. Now what they found is that about 200 micrograms seems to be the ideal dose if you want to stabilize bone. So we often use 200 micrograms. It's certainly safe to use higher dose, but a nice dose is 200 micrograms and it's often used in the studies. It's shown to reduce bone loss and enhance bone formation, as I said, and most interestingly, it improves arterial stiffness and reduces arterial calcification. You've all heard about calcium. Is there a concern taking calcium? Will it harden my arteries? Well, it seems to be when they gave people high-dose calcium, like 1,500, 2,000 milligrams, and did not give them vitamin K, a small number of people did develop hardening of the arteries, and that's because of the relative vitamin K deficiency in comparison to the calcium. And remember, it's only K2 that has been so highly documented to protect from arterial calcification, not K1, which comes from plants. So you often ask, well, you understand K2, there's MK7. Then people say, what about MK4? They hear about MK4. MK4, as we saw in the illustration a moment ago, is another form of vitamin K2, but this was, it, it occurs naturally, but what we see today has been synthesized in Japan and actually made into a drug for bone health. MK4 is a form of vitamin K that, you, that in Japan is sold as a drug, but here it can be sold as a vitamin. What it is is fairly high dose vitamin K, and the distinction between MK4 and MK7, well, one of the distinctions is that MK4 has a very short half-life. And so you have to take it, a lot of it, and take it several times a day. So the therapeutic dose with this is 15 milligrams. Now remember, with MK7, we talk micrograms, which are thousands of times smaller. Much more MK4 is needed. 15 milligrams three times a day because you have to spread it throughout the day because it has a very short half-life. It only stays active in the body for a short period of time. It has a short half-life. It's developed and sold as a drug. And the interesting thing, because it was sold as a drug, there was a lot of studies on fracture reduction. The Japanese have done many studies. We can give you a link to those studies. And they've shown that there's quite a significant fracture reduction. In fact, the suggestion is that this MK4, if you believe the Japanese studies, it works as well as the US drugs, if not even a bit better, perhaps with less side effects. So just think of this in terms of a drug therapy. Uh, we at the Center for Better Bones tend to use MK7 because it's a natural form of vitamin K and it's a therapeutic dietary dose. However, if someone has had vertebral fractures, um, it's reasonable to think about this more expensive and more cumbersome to take because you need to take high dose three times a day of this MK4. Now the second question is, is MK7 or MK4 better for strengthening bone? As I mentioned, they both have some value. We personally think that MK7, the natural food factor, is going to be shown as effective as MK4. However, because it's not a drug, there's not all this money behind it. Nobody can patent it. So there have been many studies on arterial calcification, on halting bone loss, but no fracture studies yet on MK7. The fracture studies are on MK4, and it seems to be quite effective. This is the link I mentioned. If you want to look at what studies have been done by the Japanese on this drug of MK4, you can look it up. And there is a great database of studies on MK7 too. And like I say, when at all possible, we at the Center for Better Bones like to use the food factors and we use the MK7. But you would like a dose of like 200 micrograms or at least 100, 200 is even better. The next question is, should you use vitamin K and vitamin D together? So, well, actually, vitamin K and vitamin D are both essential for bone health. And I just saw a study recently working with little children and it really found that if they gave these children adequate vitamin K and adequate vitamin D, they develop much stronger bones. 
it's very clear that everyone should use vitamin K and D together. You can take them at the same time or you can take them separately. They're both fat soluble. They both stay in the body for a nice long time. Vitamin K has about a 24 hour, vitamin K is MK7, has a 24 hour half-life. Vitamin D, of course, has a long half-life in the body. So yes, take them together and they're both important to take. And if you don't know how much vitamin D to take, we have several blogs on that. You really want to get a blood level of say like 50 to 60 mg. The next question, how much vitamin K should I take with or without vitamin D2 or D3? Just to summarize again, this is a really popular question. You want to take of MK7, let's say 100 to 200 micrograms. In some studies, they're using 350. The milligrams are in MK4, which is a much shorter half-life, so you need to take 15 micrograms three times a day. In MK7, you're talking about micrograms. And you do want to take it with vitamin D. The average person uses about 4,000 units of vitamin D a day. Your need may be more or less. Have your vitamin D tested, and then you'll know exactly how much to take because you want to keep like a 50 or 60 level of vitamin D. Okay. Question number five. Is MK4 just as beneficial as MK7 despite requiring more frequent doses? Well, what do you think the answer is? The research would suggest that for building bone, certainly MK4 is just as effective. It's more expensive and it's more difficult to take because you have to take it three times a day. So we really prefer MK7, but they should be equally effective for the arterial calcification. There hasn't been as many studies done on MK4 as there has been done on MK7. So for that reason also, we prefer MK7 in most cases. Is there any danger of supplementing with vitamin K? You know, it's always good to ask the question, well, is this safe? Is there any danger in it? If you look at the Linus Pauling Institute, the review of vitamin K that they have, you'll see that it is notably an extremely safe vitamin. And the only issue with vitamin K is if you're taking a drug called Coumadin or Warfarin, it's an old fashioned blood thinner that they still use. And that is actually, it thins the blood by being an anti-K factor. So if you take vitamin K with Coumadin, also known as Warfarin, you won't get as much, the warfarin won't be as effective. So you don't want to mix vitamin K with Coumadin, also known as warfarin, unless you talk to your doctor and they're monitoring their coagulation factors. Otherwise, the only indication is if a person has very strange clotting disorder, like here at the Center for Better Bones, we did some research with vitamin K, MK7, and the and, and when we talk with the researchers in, in the Netherlands, Dr. Vermeer, the man who spent his life studying MK7, he said the only thing to watch out for is a person with a strange clotting disorder. Then you might not want to use any form of vitamin K, uh, any form of vitamin K, MK7 or MK4. Question number seven. Is 100 micrograms of K2 daily, 50 micrograms in the morning and 50 micrograms in the evening, and we're going to presume they're probably talking about MK7. Remember, because MK7 is in the microgram dose. You could take MK four in this dose, but it would be very tiny. Is this safe within the limits for not developing blood clots? Now this is a very important thing because as you've probably heard, vitamin K is essential for clotting. That's why in this country, when a baby's born, we give them a shot of vitamin K because the mothers very likely do not have enough vitamin K, that baby does not have a vitamin K, and the baby may bleed. And so we we preempt that by giving every kid a shot of vitamin K. But once you activate the clotting factor with vitamin K, you can't activate it again. In other words, it doesn't induce clotting. It makes clotting possible, but you can't super clot because of vitamin K. And again, I would say the only concern is if you have a strange clotting disorder, a strange blood disorder, you talk with your physician about the use of vitamin K. But it is vastly safe for the majority of the population. And then, should a person adjust the amount of vitamin K supplementation one takes according to the amount of vitamin K in their diet? So this brings us to the question, well, just how much vitamin K am I getting in my diet? 
And I'm going to show you in another slide a couple of things. One is that you're not getting very much MK7. There's a little MK7 in hard cheeses, there is a tiny bit in butter, and there's a lot of it in natto fermented soy, but I would love to hear from any of you that are eating natto. It's a great idea. Your import, import stores will have it. It's often frozen. If you can eat it, great, eat it, because it will have a lot of MK7. Otherwise, you're not getting much MK7. The, the K1 from plants, well, you know that you can get a lot of vitamin K if you every day eat a couple of calories, a couple of collards, bok choy, broccoli. Let's see if we have an illustration here. Like for example, a half a cup of kale has 530 micrograms of K1. Uh, you can get, you know, you, you need about a thousand micrograms of K1 to properly activate that bone protein. So if you eat plenty of green leafy vegetables, the kale, collard, spinach, parsley, broccoli, you get a pretty good start. But the leafy greens have quite a bit, then you start getting much less and less. It's another great, great reason to eat those green leafy vegetables. But even if you're taking a lot of greens, you'll get K1, but you're not going to be getting K2. So you really don't have to worry about adjusting your dose of vitamin K down, because we mainly supplement with a small amount of K1, like a dietary recommendation, which is very small, and then MK7 in the form of like 100 to 200 micrograms, which will be very hard to get from your diet. You'll see here the MK7 sources. This might be hard for you to read, but natto is a great source. It has like a thousand micrograms. Goose liver pate, if, if you've had any of that lately, has some. Certain cheeses have quite a bit of both MK4 and MK7, maybe 50 micrograms if you get a nice aged cheese. The aged cheese, because it's the bacteria that produces the MK7. Egg yolks, at least egg yolks from Holland, have a little MK4, and butter has a small amount. Really difficult. We want to eat fermented foods, but it's difficult to get enough vitamin K, particularly K2s. The last question was someone asked if MK7 can cause sleep issues. And uh, we use MK7 for every client in our program. I've never heard of it happening. But it's always possible that someone finds that their system is energized by taking a supplement. So if you were having a sleep problem, I would just take the MK7 early in the day. That should work out just fine. So it's been my pleasure answering these questions. Remember, we're at the Center for Better Bones. If you don't subscribe to our weekly blog, go to betterbones.com. It's been fun with you today, and send us your questions. We'll do the best to answer them all. In the meantime, we hope each of you stays stronger longer.